my business capital. It also helps me not mix my business money with the money I get from the garden. Aha. Do you know that this book is showing me that you haven't paid me the carton of soda I advanced you last hey, month? Mugasha. You also remember that? Yes! This book helps me to remember every detail about this show. Huh? Mugasha. Guy, you know things and you don't even tell me. You didn't ask. Eh? Try it. You'll thank me later. <laughs> Let me first deal with the customer. But, Wiri, don't forget to pay the URA tax in time. <laughs> I won't. I will not. Okay. <laughs> Why, Tabu? Don't know, Marilisa. And what are you doing throwing papers all over the place? I'm looking for an invoice for a sound system and cables that I received yesterday. But I can't find it. You know there is a way of keeping all this in one place and available to you as and when you need it. I really wish there was one. Because the way these invoices grow legs and disappear. I believe this is what you're looking for. Eh? eh? Now how did it get there? Tabu! Do you know that with Efris, you can stay on track of all your business transactions and improve on your record keeping? How so? Katituliku computer with Efris. I just search using the fiscal document number and I retrieve the records I'm looking for. Bookkeeping becomes simple after that. Ah, kapo, awesome, yeah. I began using URS Kakasa solutions and now I'm in charge of my business and you can as well. Kakasa, be sure you are in charge of your business. Uganda Revenue Authority. Developing Uganda together. <laughs> That's my little angel rose. Together with millions of other children, my daughter Rose is assured of learning something new every day. Moses, my husband, just like many other commercial farmers, has his business supported so he can provide for us. When my other little one was on the way, even with my pregnancy complications, it was a quick, smooth ride to Mulago Specialized Women and Neonatal Hospital. Also, my new baby was able to make it through his first days with the help of specialized equipment, thanks to the reliable electricity, which has also been extended throughout the country. All this and more has been made possible because of you. Join us and together let's do more for our country. Get your free tin at www.ura.go.ug. Thank you for paying your taxes. Uganda Revenue Authority. Developing Uganda together. I'm called Natmanya Skovia. I came to get a tin. I was passing by and I saw a bus. So I was forced to come here and get one. It was not hectic because it didn't take much time, like five minutes or less. Very happy. I'm still training with national water, and without a tin, you cannot be employed. I encourage everyone out there who is not having a tin to come and register, because I know the world that is coming without a tin you will not be able to do anything. Uganda Revenue Authority. Developing Uganda together. Acquiring a tin is now easier than ever before with a new interface that is brief, simple and cuts out all the excess fields from previous applications. All you need is your national ID or driver's license or passports and internet access and you're good to go. No more waiting in long queues as you can now acquire a tin instantly from wherever you are. Remember, it's free! Experience our new and improved modern interface that is is user friendly. Thank you for paying your taxes. Uganda Revenue Authority. Developing Uganda together. Kapo, you seem to be in a hurry. Where are you going to? I'm gonna pay you a visit. 
Why would anyone visit URA? Of all places? To know more about the Kakasa Business Solutions, namely Digital Tracking Solution, the Voluntary Disclosure Program and Electronic Fiscal Recepting, and Invoicing Solution, which have turned my business around. You know I need to be on top of my game to protect my empire. <laughs> yeah, if you know, you know. I too need to know what Kapo knows. Kakasa, be sure. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the customs webinar. The team before you is the team of proper officers that have come from customs. To start with, I would introduce myself as the moderator. I'm Doreen Namsubo, coming from customs, sitting in the DPC division for the DPC department. And I'm with a team of gentlemen. I'll start with from the far left, and they will introduce themselves. Kindly introduce yourself, Jen Dennis. Yes, good morning, viewers, and all that, uh, all those listening to us. My name is uh, Dennis Mayamba, and I'm an officer at DPC, the Document Processing Center. And uh, today I'll be taking you through the DPC process, particularly the aspect of uh, general goods. Good morning, viewers. Evaluation officer, DPC, specifically motor vehicles. I'll be taking you through DPC processes for motor vehicles and clearance documents required. Thank Enjoy you. the program. Good morning, viewers, and those ones who are listening <coughs> using other channels. I'm called Simon Okello, um, officer under CCD's office. Today I will be taking you through splitting of manifest. Enjoy your viewing. Thank you very much, my panelists, for today. The topic today is DPC Processing Center. What processes are in DPC and what is required as documents in DPC? Starting with Dennis, what is DPC? Someone out there needs to know. What is DPC? When you say DPC, some people call in and say, what is DPC? They need to understand. What do you mean by Document Processing Center? Uh, thank you, Doreen. For our dear viewers, DPC, as is commonly referred to as, is uh, the Document Processing Center. As the word suggests, uh, the Document Processing Center is a one roof environment where the document check function of the goods clearance process is done. What we mean is that the DPC handles all the documentation check for all these declarations which are made from various stations, be it in Maraba, uh, in uh, Busia, you're making a declaration under UG Kampala, uh, in Entebbe. The doc check function of all those declarations is done at the Document Processing Center, the DPC. Uh, what that means is that uh, the DPC forms a very important part in the goods clearance process. It's actually the engine of uh, the goods clearance process, given that document check is the core, is at the center of uh, the clearance of goods. Okay, thank you, Dennis. Uh, our dear viewers and listeners, I think you've heard that the DPC, it is the core point of customs where the different documents are checked. When was it found, Dennis? Maybe somebody will need to know. When was DPC found and why was it found? Was there any problem? Yeah, DPC was uh, started actual operations in 2017. Before that, as you may recall, we had what we call the customs business centers, which were in across uh, the carrier stations. Okay. Uh, for example, if you're handling your goods from Tukula, probably you brought in a consignment. The process of document check would happen in Tukula. Someone who has come through Maraba would also have their goods cleared at that point. The document check function will also be done uh, in those, uh, those various stations, in TV and all other stations. Okay. Uh, so the document processing center uh, was put in place, like I said, started in 2017, particularly to harmonize all the differences which uh, were resulting from having the document check function taking place in different uh, stations. So okay. the core uh, reason why this uh, uh, DPC was established was to harmonize 
uh, the application of the customs laws and procedures, some of which would include uh, the valuation of goods and all other uh, processes, so that there is some bit of uniformity. There is a uniformity in how we treat a consignment which has come from Maraba, how you treat a consignment which has come from Tukula, how you treat a consignment which has come from Entebbe. So DPC uh, was established to create that uniformity so that all people are given the same treatment in as far as the customs laws and procedures are, are concerned. It was also uh, uh, established to ensure that there is faster clearance, faster clearance of goods so that we reduce on the clearance time. Because if you have all these things handled in one central uh, location, it is much easier and it is faster to process these goods as fast as possible that we realize a uh, uh, high turnaround time, both for the importers, which of course would in turn also lead to uh, an increase in revenue on the side of, 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 of URA. So those okay. are some of the reasons why uh, the DPC, why DPC was, was, uh, was found was, was, was established. to try and fasten the clearance process of the goods. As you will all be aware, that the, the least time you spend for the king, the least time you spend when you're doing business is you're cutting on so much cost that you you you're incurring when you're carrying out your business. But I would want also to know somebody would want to know out there as you do these processes and you do your business, what legal backing do you have? Do you have any legal framework that you're basing on? What is that that you have to to lean on as you're trying to do your business in DPC? Yeah, the work we do in DPC is work of tax collection. And tax collection is a matter of law. So okay. everything that we do, the processes, uh, the, 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 the aspects of valuation, and any other collection of any tax that is resultant from the process we do in DPC is backed by uh, a law. And some of these laws Majorly for customs, the East African Customs uh, uh, Management Act, and then uh, some of these give us the provisions on treatment of uh, various uh, uh, goods, how the cargo is handled, how um, in case an offence is committed, how is it treated, the valuation of uh, goods is also uh, uh, domesticated in the East African Customs Management Act. That's in the fourth schedule. So besides the ESC uh, CMA, we also have the WCO uh, valuation agreement. That is also domesticated still in the fourth schedule of the East African Customs Management Act. You have the Income Tax Act, which guides us on the collection of the holding tax, the Excise Duty Act, where excise duty is collectible. The Road and Traffic Safety Act deals with issues of motor vehicles, uh, the issues of years, the issues of which motor vehicles brought in, what tax is applicable, and how and what. And then you have the Excise Duty Act, the Finance Act. Of course, you know every year, uh, if there's any view on the tax, either on the rates or introduction of any new tax, all those are done through the Finance Act. So as DPC, we amalgamate all these uh, laws, and all these laws give us uh, the, the, the mandate to perform uh, our function. OK, thank you very much, Dennis. I think this, Andrew, will take it. Who are the different stakeholders that we are dealing with in DPC? Are we one-man show, or there are other different stakeholders that are linking into our business? Who are they? Maybe somebody out there would want to know. Thank you, Namusuo, for that question. We have several stakeholders that we deal with as DPC. Several, uh, most of them are government ministries, departments, and agencies, okay. like the Ministry of Defense, the okay. Ministry of Internal Affairs, the prisons. We have agents, clearing agents, licensed by customs as a department. We have a uh, Ministry of Works. Okay. We have uh, we have uh, National Bureau of Standards. Okay. The Standards Regulation Agency. We have uh, traders under their umbrella organizations, several, yeah. CASITA, ETC, ETC. Okay. That, that in a way, our work resolve, revolves around, around, yeah, around most of those people. Because and in a way, it affects, it affects their other. businesses. Okay. It, we, feed in, we, feed in, we feed in their activities, in okay. a way. Or, 
in a way we, we find ourselves feeding in their activities. activities and they also feed in ours because the information has to be shared Definitely. collectively Definitely. how it helps your age might be different from how it helps the, the person exactly. out there okay thank you very much Andrew yes Dennis back to you you say DPC as the name suggests document processing center we are processing documents what kind of process are we handling in DPC Doreen, deep down there in the village, wants to know, when you say process, what do you mean? Where do we start from and where do we stop? Maybe you kindly take us through how does somebody start, or where, was, where does the work of DPC start and where does it stop? Uh, thank you very much, Doreen. Again, for the benefit of our viewers, <coughs> like I had earlier on indicated, DPC is where the document check function in the goods clearance process uh, happens. Now, document check in regards to the clearance of goods is a process which happens after goods have been selected for doc check. In this aspect, it means the transaction is in a yellow lane. For those who are in the goods clearance process, uh, you know very well that customs has several lanes in the clearance of goods. Uh, you have the red lane, which is high risk. You have the yellow lane, which looks at the uh, document check. You have green lane, uh, low risk, and you have the blue lane, which looks at the uh, post clearance audit. Now, as DPC, our function is mainly on the yellow lane. Now, the yellow lanes we handle may either be those who are, which are auto-selected by the system, meaning they are regarded as uh, the risk is relative, and therefore document check should be done, or those which were initially selected red, and have gone through the process of physical examination, but now have been rerouted to yellow. So as the DPC, our function starts when the declaration is rerouted to yellow. Now, at that point, what happens is that the customs management system, in this case, the Skuda World system, the moment an entry is selected yellow, either, like I've said, automatically, or it is rerouted after verification, the system will assign that declaration automatically to an officer at the document processing center. And that officer uh, in the DPC environment is an officer at level one, the doc check officer, uh, who then goes through that declaration, compares the declaration uh, on its own merits, uh, on the attachments, on how it has been declared, how is the verif compares it with the verification account in the event that there is a VA attached to it, and all other relevant documents, the mandatory documents which are required for clearance process, which we shall later on take you through. Now, in the event that that declaration conforms, or in the event that the declaration is found to be satisfactory, then that officer at the level one, the doc check officer, the document check officer, can then release that declaration which means the client will then be able to uh, proceed and have their goods exited from the, the, either the bonded warehouse or uh, wherever the items would be. However, there are also scenarios where the declaration may not conform. Maybe there are cases of misclassifications, maybe there are variations in the documentation, or maybe uh, from the verification account, what has been declared and what is uh, found at verification may not either tally or the items are totally different, or maybe there's even a misuse of a customs procedure code, or maybe someone has wrongly claimed preferential treatment uh, and maybe either reduced or removed import duty completely. All these factors are considered at that point. So in the event that there is non-conformity, or that there is a bridge or any, or where the officer may require additional documentation, or maybe clarity, or an explanation from the client, then such a declaration then is queried. That declaration is rerouted to query. And when it is rerouted to query, it gets back to the declarant. And the declarant will be able to see what the officer seeks to either understand, or maybe the officer is requesting for a document, or Maybe the officer has highlighted the issues that the declaration has, the non-conformity areas that have been found on that declaration. And it's at that point then that the client, or the, the declarant in this case, should be able to respond to those issues 
by accepting the receiving the query, accepting it, and providing uh, feedback. Now, when that feedback is provided, that declaration then will move in DPC to an officer at level two, which is the query and amendment level. That okay. officer then at level two will review the query which had been raised to the client at level one and compare it with the response which the client has provided. If uh, the, the response the client has provided, it could either be an explanation or an additional document or any other issues which have been raised and see whether the client has sufficiently addressed them or the client has provided the documentation which was required or there are still other issues which may also come up. It's at that point then that the query amendment officer will take the decision in the event that everything has been responded to adequately or whatever documentation was required has been provided. Then the officer at level two, query and amendment level, can uh, archive that query and release that declaration. However, there are also scenarios where the response provided by the client either may not be satisfactory or it might be partial or whatever documentation was requested has not been availed or any other issues which are within then have not been uh, addressed. Uh, addressed or maybe there was a suggestion from the level one officer either regarding uh, issues of maybe seizure or misclassifications or there were issues of maybe undervaluations and all this. So the query response the client has availed will determine so much on the next course of action, which may either be a release or may also be an additional inquiry or an amendment. Because if still there is need for clarity on the responses provided, or still there is documentation which is not sufficient, which the, the, the declarant still needs to provide, then the level two officer can go ahead and put what we call an inquiry to inquire uh, about those additional things, or even the level two officer may be able to identify some other gaps which probably initially had not been identified at level one, or can also arise as a result of the response that the client has provided to the first query. Now, it's at that point that the officer may raise either an inquiry, seeking more clarity, or maybe informing the client of what uh, the next course of action would be, either that there is going to be an amendment, or either that they should provide additional documentation, or even that maybe seek for an audience with the client where necessary, where there is a bit of confusion which, which will be uh, best sorted on a face-to-face -face interaction, which is on a rare circumstance, but in the interest of trying to save time, at times it would uh, reach that point. But if there is conformity, the query has been sufficiently responded to, the requested documentations have been availed, and all other factors all, all other uh, uh, documents and all the queries which were raised have been addressed, then the officer should be able to release that declaration. Thank you very much, Dennis, our dears and viewers and listeners. I think Dennis has been so elaborate. He has taken us through the process of what happens in DPC, their processes. He talked about the entry being selected yellow the different lanes of clearances that we have. DPC specifically lead, deals with those that are selected yellow, where the dog check officer at level one, he also mentioned about levels in DPC. We have different levels in DPC for different officers. There is a dog check officer that is at level one who handles the documents, uh, who handles the entry at, at the first time, raises queries if not satisfied, in the event that officer is satisfied with the documents that are attached, as we are going to clearly bring them in our discussion what kind of documents they are, if he's satisfied with the documents and they're in line with the declaration that the, the client has made, that officer will go ahead and indeed release the entry. But in the event, in the event that the officer is not satisfied and there's something lacking, or there is some other question that he wants to ask, he or she will raise a query and automatically that entry will leave the officer's login 
and goes to the client who later responds. And upon response, it doesn't come back to that same le level one officer. That entry goes to the level two. So we have two levels in DPC. We have level one, that's the doc check officer, and level two now that is query and amendment. Level two, as Dennis said, we, that's then the level two officer will quality assure the query that was made with, by the level one officer and really ascertain whether it is sufficient, whether it is valid or not valid. In the event that it's not valid, the, doc, the query and amendment officer on level two will take a decision then, either by also reviewing the documents again or release the entry. So those are the levels and the different processes that happen in DPC. In the event that we are satisfied with the declaration the client has put, the documents that the client has uploaded onto the system, we clear the goods most likely on level one. But in the event that the documents attached are not sufficient, they are lacking, they are false, there is something that is not adding up when we compare them to the declaration that you've made to customs, we shall query and later amend the entry. Maybe then you take her through. What do you base on when you say you later amend the entry? What, what kind of process do you do? Why is your basis when you are amending the entry? So like I had uh, earlier said, an amendment is a result of either unsatisfactory documentation or someone has not been able to back their declaration by sufficient evidence. As you are aware, customs uh, uh, in DPC, we handle mainly issues of valuation and also document check function. There are those items even which do not pay anything, but we have to make sure that the declaration has been made correctly. Now, where there is incorrectness, or where there is some bit of falsehood, or where there is non-conformity, either in, in misclassification, or in abuse of uh, uh, preferential treatment, rules of origin, or where there is undervaluation, which uh, might be deliberate or otherwise un unintended, for example, then an amendment becomes inevitable. Okay. You are aware, for example, that uh, somebody may have imported a particular item and when it is classified, for example, to 425%, maybe it had been placed under zero. Now, after this has been brought to the notice of the client, there has to be an agreement. Many times the client will respond and say, say you are meant, or we inform the client of what we are going to do and the basis of that. As you know, issues of classification are based in the common external tariff, which indicate to you where a particular item should be placed. So if, for example, you brought a pen and you classify it as a machine, then definitely that amendment will have to happen if the VA verification account is indicating that it is indeed a pen. So that entry is going to be amended. Two, in scenarios where there is uh, undervaluation, which I've told you about, undervaluation, you know that the primary method of customs valuation is the transaction value method. When you look at the fourth shade of the East African Custom Management Act, it clearly states to you uh, methods of determining the customer's value. Now, if the client is not able to satisfy method one, which is the transaction value method, you have declared, but you're not able to sufficiently support that that is actually the price that you paid or will be paid in the event of either a credit sale or something, if you can't, we can't determine that, or you can't satisfactorily prove that that is the price that was actually paid or payable, of course, in consideration of the adjustments provided for under Article 8, then uh, customs then, with the, the interaction and with the information that they will give you through the query process, will uh, follow the, 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 the goods valuation uh, methods sequentially as they are in the fourth schedule and may uh, apply alternative methods of valuation. Now, in the event that that is applied, that declaration therefore will be amended. It's also very important to note, for example, that even as you defend your value, the documentation should reflect the realities on the ground. You know that uh, we live in an era 
where it is so easy for people to play around with documents. And because they say, oh, customs needs a proof of payment, what do they want? They want a TT. Someone can bring a TT from NASA. Someone can do all these things. These are the realities on and the they ground. they end up attaching it for the sake. Exactly. Mm. So they should also be realistic, for example. Mm. If currently we are saying you have a one by 40 feet consignment mm. of maybe uh, textiles or, or, or garments from China, you, you cannot say that I have all the documentation and that that consignment is worth 5,000 US dollars. It should also be realistic enough. Because we've had scenarios where somebody is saying that I have all my documentation, I've provided it, but then customs is disregarding the documentation. Customs may disregard the documentation on the basis of that. That's why there are these methods of valuation. What was the cost of identical goods, for example, method two? Someone imported a similar consignment at or about the same time, from the same country of export, export. and into the same country for example, and they declare let's say $100,000, you brought the same items at about the same time and you're saying yours cost 10000 So it should reflect the realities. The documentation should reflect the realities. So, so all these other things are the ones which bring about these amendments, for example, where alternative methods are applied, where you've applied the wrong CPC, for example, you've, uh, goods are not supposed to, like, yeah, they're not exempted from VAT, but you've applied the CPC, say, 478, and uh, we bring that to your attention and we are able to come to an agreement and indicate to you that indeed these goods uh, VAT is payable. Then an amendment is inevitable to bring that into a common regime where we collect the VAT. I've already highlighted to you where there is misclassification. I've even told you that there can be undervaluation which may not be delivered. For example, a client might attach an invoice which is talking about cost and freight. But you know that customs value for goods which are arriving by port, for example, the, the customs value is cost insurance and freight. Insurance has been omitted. So where such is found, then definitely an amendment uh, will have to happen have to so that we arrive at customs value. Like I said, all these are matters of law. Whatever we do is not uh, arbitrary. The process is followed and also the law is followed in uh, trying to, to make this amendment that we do either in value or classification or any other amendment that might uh, arise from time to time. I had earlier indicated to you that we primarily deal with yellow lane. At times, of course, unless there are also transactions which may go blue, but they can be an alert or highlighted from uh, other units and may it require us to maybe make an amendment and collect something in the event that someone had misclassified an entry and it went green. Other units which are in charge of monitoring that may be able to communicate to us and maybe we can also make that collection. But that is once in a while from time to time. Okay, thank you. Noreen, if I may come in. Yes, Andrew. It is also important to note that the DPC processes for all customs declarations, okay. whether for general goods, or motor vehicles are the same. Oh, yeah. The True. only differing points are mainly caused by determinants of tax okay. and uh, clearance documents required. Okay. That is important to note to for note our from viewers. Us. Okay. Thank you very much, Andrew, for the point of information. Our dear viewers and listeners, I think you've heard from Dennis. In DPC, by the time they amend your entry, We've, had, we've done due diligence, we've compared your documentation with the declaration, and when we are not satisfied, as he says, in valuation, there are methods of valuation. If you're to go method one, the transaction value method, that is the price actually paid or payable. If you're not going to, to demonstrate, because we speak with the system, most of the time we are speaking with the system, we don't speak with you, the clients out there, if you went out there and imported an item and you declared to customs that have bought this book, this pen, this much, and you failed to demonstrate that actually this pen cost me this much and this is how much I paid for it, then we shall have no option but refute your documentation 
and go with other methods of valuation where we are going to compare a writer somewhere who went in the same country of export and imported the same pen at around the same time. And we compare if Rita brought it at $10 and Doreen is coming in with $5, there is already something that we need to question and ask why. Why 10 and why 5? And automatically we shall raise your value to match Rita because you went to the same supplier in the same country of export and imported those goods, but you're telling us something different from what Rita said. So eventually we refuse the method one valuation, which most of the clients really cry for. But if the officer back in DPC is not satisfied and there is any query that on the documents, if there is something that leads to doubt, then eventually those documents will be refuted and the officer at level one will query the entry and later go to level two and we raise the top up and give you other values as we explained and even Dennis has explained. So as Andrew put it the other, just a while ago that the processes are the same in clearing. Yes, Dennis has brought it out in the general goods. I want to bring in Andrew at that point to take us through about the motor vehicles. What kind of motor vehicles are allowed in Uganda? What years? What month? Do we based on the month, the year, the date? That is a bit question out there. What cars are allowed to be imported in Uganda? Thank you, Doreen. Actually, this is uh, confusing and it has been uh, running for a while, but people haven't gotten used to determining the allowed motor vehicles in Uganda. Actually, the law that informs used motor, motor vehicles uh, required to be registered in Uganda, it is the Traffic and Road Safety Act, Section 14A, 1998 okay. as amended, Act 2018. Okay. It stipulates that the period of importation of motor vehicles should not exceed 15 years from okay. the date of manufacture. This law was developed to reduce carbon emissions in the environment as well as reduction of accidents on the roads. So the moment your motor vehicle is uh, 15 years and above, registration in Uganda is prohibited. So we look at motor vehicles below 15 years. And the moment your motor vehicle arrives at uh, a port of entry, when it has uh, a year to make 15 years. A year to make 15 years? Yes. Okay. We have an administrative measure that requires you to have that motor vehicle taxes paid for at the ports of entry. And okay. for Uganda's case, that is Mombasa and Dar es Salaam. But recently we had, uh, we had a review, though temporarily, that reduced the period for motor vehicles of a kind to six months. Okay. Because of uh, the hard economic conditions that we operate in, issues. Mm. exacerbated by the COVID, COVID. pandemic. Okay. So the period has been temporarily relaxed by customs management from a year to six months, provided okay. for you to wear housing that motor vehicle. Provided taxes on that motor vehicle are paid within three months to expire of the period of the year of manufacture. Okay. You need from to bring one that year to again. Six months, you you throw more light on that again about the period the, the period bit. I'm mm. sure somebody maybe has not got it properly. What regulation has been relaxed a bit from what period to what period? The regulation of of one paying for taxes for a motor vehicle that has a year to expire to make fifteen years. One on year. Event, on event that it is brought in when it is fourteen years to make 15 years. Okay. Requirement was that you pay for taxes, direct taxes, at the Other ports of entry. of entry. That's Mombasa. That is Mombasa uh, or, or Dar es Salaam, Salaam Tanzania, yes. which has been reviewed, reduced to six months. Okay, temporarily or it's permanent? It is temporarily. Okay. Definitely to revert back to one year. To the one year. To one okay. year, because it is administrative. This it is administrative. Andrew, maybe if I check, with this period of revision is for how long? How long is it going? We are not certain, okay. but management will be, inf will be informed okay. of when the economic hardships 
a little the pandemic better. Pandemic has uh, has come down, but the economic hardships because of the geopolitics politics of the world okay. are exacerbating the conditions and uh, the standards of living. Okay. Maybe that is what informed their review of their condition currently to six months instead of one year. Okay, so clients out there, please. I the think moment, you can use the provision, the relaxation that the is... The relaxation. That is On the event on, that you can't pay for taxes at the port, upon arrival, yes. you are given a grace period of uh, three months to have it warehoused as you mobilize for taxes to pay. Yeah, but you mentioned of the condition. What, how much must they pay? Payment of taxes is also informed by the Traffic and Road Safety Act. Okay. 1998 as amended mainly Act 2018, because uh, we have what we call environmental levies. Environmental levies are there to help you and me, okay. to reduce on the, on the emissions from those exceedingly old motor vehicles. The moment it is nine years and above, okay. you happen import, importing a motor vehicle, a saloon motor vehicle, a station wagon motor vehicle, a sedan, Environmental levies payable are at a rate of 50%. On top okay. of the other customs dues, the import duty is not zero rated. It is at 25%. Okay. We have VAT. It is at 18%. We have withholding tax. We have definitely, the moment you have import duty, the, the declaration will be assessed environmental levies. Okay. And 50% environmental levy or surcharge. Or such and if it happens to be a good scarring vehicle, lorries, the ones we commonly call lorries, or trucks that convey goods from point A to point B, from our gardens, upon harvesting from markets, the goods scarring vehicles, and the pickup trucks, the dual purpose that dominate our parking, mm -hmm. you are like, uh, the double cabins. Mm -hmm. Those are all goods carrying vehicles. Environmental levies payable or applicable are at a rate of 20%. Okay, that's for the trucks. The moment they are nine years and above. Okay. It is different from the saloon, the station wagon, and the sedans. Okay. If they are prime movers, a prime mover is a tractor head. Still, Environmental levies payable are at a rate of 20%. This was, by the framers of our laws, it was done. You may wonder the difference between 20 and 50. Because Uganda, by nature, conveyance of our goods from point A to B is by road transport. It was reduced to 20% to ease the, the to, ease, to, ease, to ease doing of business in okay. the economy. Because apparently, if it was put at a rate of 50%, it would have made, made it difficult for people doing business. It would have okay. made it expensive. And ultimately, that cost would have been pushed to the common man, me and you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then we have uh, plant and machinery. Okay. Plant and machinery, in ordinary, what you call uh, excavators, what you know as excavators, wheel loaders, uh, crane trucks that are purposely for loading and uh, offloading cargo without um, provision for goods conveyance. Those ones don't attract, they are not subject to surcharge. Import duty is zero rated. They okay. only pay VAT and registration fees. Okay. People have issues with ambulances. Yeah. Because they are medical. Somebody will say an ambulance. You, you have been importing an ambulance that is, is nine years and above, it will be subject to environmental mm -hmm. levy at a rate of 50%. If the ambulance is nine Beyond years? nine years and above, it will not, it will not attract environmental levies. Mm -hmm. Although, on an ambulance, the import duty is zero rated. Okay. VAT is zero rated. They use extension procedure code 478. But for horses, mm -hmm. for conveyance of our human remains, mm -hmm. those ones, VAT is not zero rated. Andrew, there is an they issue. They pay VAT. They, are, they also pay surcharge. 
if okay. they happen to be in nine years and above. and above. But import duty is zero rated. They also pay withholding tax unless the, the owner is withholding tax exempt. exempt. But the registration fee for ambulance, for horses, it is 800,000. But remember the horses, the VAT is not zero rated. For ambulances, it is zero rated. But the moment they are nine years and above, they attract such an environmental levy at a rate of 50%. We also have what we call panel vans. Mm -hmm. They are s s s synonymous with uh, cafe javas, conveyance of uh, food stuff. Food stuff. Panel vans, they are good scaring vehicles. But on the event that uh, you receive a declaration for a panel van, you need to request for pictures to confirm the interior and the exterior to confirm that it is really a panel van. Because there is likelihood of you facilitating registration of a van as a panel van only to go out and it turns into a matatu. So you need to confirm provision of photos to confirm the interior and exterior. Okay. And the moment it is also nine years and above, tax treatment is the same as for is similar to the goods carrying vehicles. Carrying goods carrying 20% surcharge, below nine years it doesn't attract surcharge. So basically that is the law about environmental levies. And surcharge. About motor vehicles allowed in Uganda and not allowed in Uganda. What just okay. a van and a van? A panel van ideally has a seating capacity of two people. That's the a driver, panel van. The driver and a co-driver. The back is, is typically wood. windowless. It is full of wood. It is actually closed. The back, the, the interior of the back of the rear has no provision of, of any passengers, of carrying any passengers. To be carried there, it is typically cargo. The outlook has to be typically for cargo. That is the difference. Okay, maybe and you throw more light on the trucks have different tonnages. Which which tonnage attracts duty, which tonnage does not. There is also that issue of trucks. Thank you very much, Doreen, actually. Mm. That had skipped my mind. That it, it is a, good, very, a very good question. Those are what I talked of as determinants of tax in motor vehicles. Okay. There are several determinants of tax. Like we earlier alluded to the issue of motor vehicles allowed in for registration, environmental levies, years of manufacture, Mm. The other determinants are the revenue weights. We call the revenue the weights. The revenue weights, yes. That's the tonnage bit now. Because uh, apparently for goods carrying vehicles, they are not captured in that bracket of 15 years and above. But what the law provides for is uh, the gross vehicle weight, which is made up of the main carrying capacity okay. of the truck and the net weight minus the carrying capacity, its carrying capacity. So when you add the truck carrying capacity and its net weight, you get what we call the gross vehicle weight. Okay. So the moment the gross vehicle weight of a motor vehicle is at least four tons and above, okay. even if it is 15 years, registration is allowed in Uganda. Even if it's 15 years? It is 15 years, years and above. As long as Provided it is? Provided the gross vehicle weight is at least four tons and above. and above. But the moment it is below four tons, Okay. And it is 15 years. You try registration maybe in South Sudan or, or DRC. But in Uganda, in Uganda we, we shall not, not be allowed. We shall not allow you. But the gross vehicle weight on, on, on informing revenues applicable or tax rates applicable, the moment gross vehicle weight is below five tons, import duty fees payable are at a rate of 25%. The okay. moment it is above five tons, but not exceeding 20 tons. Ah, yeah. Okay. Import duty applicable, rates applicable, are at a rate of 10%. The moment it is 20 tons, this is now the revenue weight. The, the, yes. Revenue weight. The English call it revenue weight. The moment it is 20 tons and above, import duty is zero rated. Okay. Import duty is zero rated, but it also has an effect on the, on the registration fees payable. They also differ depending on the revenue weights. 
Okay. Mm. Thank but you. But we have very scenarios much. and okay. challenges of where people have. Uh, these are gray areas or risk areas where gross vehicle weight is 18 kgs or 18 tons and people declare it as uh, at a rate of uh, actually they use classification they have them misclassified with uh, import duty rates zero rated instead of 10 percent so issues of uh, weights issues of classification are pertinent, are pertinent when handling trucks trucks true uh, in cases where the documentation is not coming out clearly you request for provision of photos okay to because, prove to prove because the there are several determinants in the motor come. vehicle apart from the air of manufacture the body description also has has an effect on the applicable customs values the yeah. body description how it looks we have what we call recovery trucks. We have what we call concrete mixers. They have uh, applicable, different applicable customs values. So sometimes you insist on looking at the physical vehicle, the physical truck, the physical okay. pictures, provided they are endorsed by signing by a bond officer to inform okay. you better on the correct applicable rates and okay. taxes payable. Thank you very much, Andrew. Our dear viewers and listeners, that is... Andrew Busula from the Motor Vehicle Section Unit, a senior expert in the valuation of motor vehicle. I think you've heard it from there. In case there is something that has not come out well, feel free to use our chat room. Please send in your questions and they will be attended too. You'll get responses there and then. But before I bring in Simon from the system side, maybe I'll throw back to Dennis. We have talked about documents. Somebody deep in the village is wondering what kind of documents are these that we are talking about? What are these documents that we are looking at in the DPC? Or what are these documents that are required to be uploaded on the entry to support the declaration made by the client? We need to know what are they. Kindly take us through that. And maybe as Andrew put it to the other side that the process of clearing the general goods, say the the TVs, the spares, the what, is similar to the process of clearing the motor vehicle, just that there are dynamics here and there when it comes to the computation of the taxes that really are applicable. And that also Andrew will take us through, but maybe before I bring in Simon, who is going to take us through the, the manifest, please, Dennis, throw more light on what documents are those that we look at in DPC and how important are they for us to be able to compute the taxes that we have to compute. Or release the declaration as the, as the declarant has really uploaded it, if we are satisfied. What documents are those? Kindly take us through. So as regards documents, uh, customs documents are categorized into what we call mandatory documents. Those are documents that must be Availed. That you can't do without. Then we have those that we call regulatory documents. Those are documents that have to deal with the regulation and maybe certain requirements or where there are certain restrictions that need to be fulfilled. Then you also have the other documents which okay. might come as additional. So documents which are mandatory are documents which relate to the consignment. This is what we call the commercial documents. These documents relate to that consignment. For example, if you've imported a container, for example, of garments, okay, or a container, let me take for example of medicine mm. from India. The document number one, which is mandatory, is the bill of lading, okay, because the bill of lading is the one which gives you ownership, type of ownership of goods. Of those goods. Mm -hmm. The bill of lading is the one which confirms to us that this consignment actually belongs to this person, so it's consigned to this person. Because when you look at the bill of lading, the bill of lading has the consignee, okay. who is the owner of the goods. It has what we call a notified party. A notified party might be somebody who maybe should be informed, maybe it can be your agent, it can be yourself, same as okay. consignee, or, representative. or any other person may representative. Mm -hmm. So a bill of lading, yes, or the, or the banker. The bill of lading actually now confirms ownership. So it must be attached. Attached. For goods. The same thing for the airway bill for cargo which is arriving by uh, airport. airport. 
So those goods, those that document, the bill of lending, is a necessary okay. document. It should be there. Uh, the other document is uh, the commercial invoice. Commercial invoice. The commercial invoice basically is uh, shows us what was the cost of this what? This what have you bought, for mm -hmm. example, at what rate and and the various breakdowns of the cost of the goods. Okay. Like as you were very much aware, customs is so much interested in the value of your goods, so much interested in the cost of your declaration, and any other costs that you incur in the process of acquiring these goods. So we must have uh, the commercial invoice. Those are must have documents. The invoice, of course, will contain some of the terms which uh, we commonly refer to as income terms, maybe to show us whether the money you paid or whatever you're going to pay is either cost and fried, is it FOB, free on board, is it X works, is it, uh, does it also include fried, so all these other things, all those uh, information may be either in the invoice or the performer invoice. You know that you have a performer, of course, which is basically a, a document which is issued to you before confirmation. Uh, of the cargo. Then we also have the parking list. Mm -hmm. Parking list is very important because it clearly indicates to us uh, what is it that you have. If it is a container, what is in that container? How many? What are the quantity? What is the weight? And uh, all these other things. Then of course you have now the documents which relate to that consignment. The, the, the other transactional documents. If, for example, the payment was supposed to be by maybe TT, is there a bank uh, transfer payment? Mm -hmm. If it was through a letter of credit, mm -hmm. you have uh, an LC from the bank, for example. Mm -hmm. If it was, um, if uh, the, it was uh, maybe 90 days from bill of lending date, all these things the uh, come up. Mm -hmm. Then we will also have maybe uh, sales agreement. Mm. Some people have sales agreements for the declarations that they are doing with their suppliers. Mm. Others will have the purchase orders which gives a confirmation to the supplier that this is what we want, these mm. quantities and at this price. Mm. Then you also have uh, what I would now refer to as the regulated documents. For exa example, we are saying you've imported the medicine. There are required documents for importation of medicines, which may be an NDA clearance certificate. That's a regulated document. It is a requirement uh, for you to, to, to be cleared. With that. Protection of now, for those goods, you are aware there are those probably that uh, agricultural items, you need import permits mm -hmm. from the Ministry of Agriculture. Uh, you need the same if it is fisheries, if it is a plant, you will need plant. There are also permits which may be issued in regards to importation of, uh, for example, uh, certain restricted items, ammunitions, for example, mm -hmm. if the yes. private security company is importing ammunitions. There are some documentations which will, the permits which mm -hmm. allow you to bring that. So those are the ones who are referring to as the regulatory what? Regulatory documents. But also there are other documents which relate to customs value, the freight invoice, the insurance certificate, uh, those that form uh, the customer's value. There are also fumigation certificates. If you are importing, for example, used clothes, it's a requirement that those goods would have been fumigated so that we don't be bringing in uh, maybe either paste or carriers or vectors or whatever form mm -hmm. which might be harmful to our, our, people. our people. There are those requirements by Uganda National Bureau of Standards, mm -hmm. which you have the certificate yeah. of conformity, uh, the PIVOC. This is, uh, happened for both goods and also for motor vehicles. Uh, there are particular goods which require that there is a pre-export uh, 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 verification of conformity before those goods are brought in here. The same for motor vehicles also mm -hmm. to check. So those are some of the regulatory requirements that uh, like we had indicated to you that we don't operate in isolation we work with other government agencies so for them their capabilities in that area that is their expertise now they will be able to look into those documentations and interrogate them and be able to facilitate you in that regard when you've been able to to meet 
the 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 the, 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 the necessary uh, regulatory requirements so as okay. just uh, to summarize again to you like i told you the documents some of the documents that we require uh, we have the bill of lading of airway bill, the performer invoice, the commercial invoice, the purchase order, sales agreement, proof of payment, flight invoice, bank guarantee, rate of credit, insurance certificate, certificate of analysis for chemicals to show us what is the composition of some of these items, fumigation certificates, mm -hmm. and import permits, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, which are some of the requirements for a uh, goods clearance process. Like I said again, all these are dependent on the item you're bringing. That you're bringing. Yeah, yes. that's what I wanted All, you to bring out clearly. And then they are dependent on both the item that you're bringing mm -hmm. and also on the terms. Exactly. On the terms that you've yeah. agreed on with your, with your supplier. supplier. Yeah, I wanted you to throw more light on that. Yes, yes. That not every consignment that Requires comes in, all these documents, all these documents no, are no, required. No, 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 no. It's case by case Case process. by case. Yeah. But like I'd say, there are those which are mandatory. Yes. The invoice. The airway bill the and those are digital documents in the event that we have all this. Uh, if you're importing a restricted item, all that that requires a, a permit to do that. So, again, uh, like it is still a case by case by basis, case by dependent case on the item you're bringing and also the terms, for example, that you had agreed on with your supplier. With your supplier. If, for example, the term is CIF and that is what you paid direct to the supplier. Chances are that we may not see the flight invoice because that component is already incorporated in, in the, the cost that you're paying to your supplier. Okay. But then in the event that the supplier is giving you the goods, for example, as X works, it means then that you will be able to arrange your own uh, flights, Transport. for example, arrange your own insurance and all this. So we shall then require some of this documentation. So like I said, doc check is a whole... Uh, Thing, we analyze all those things. Those are all the factors we put into consideration when we are looking at your declaration. What were the terms of yeah, payment, great. for oh. example? Mm. What are the INCO terms? And like I said, all these things should have a backing. They should have a backing, basing on if the term was cost and price, then we will assume you're bearing insurance. If it was just X work, we assume you paid freight and all this. Okay. So that is basically what I would uh, maybe highlight. For now, in regards to the documentation. Actually, it is a cocktail of issues to be considered. Mm. Okay. Mm. Yeah, our dear viewers and listeners, those are the key documents, but maybe to throw more light on them, he talked about the Bill of Lading as being the mandatory document that must accompany the declaration that you have made to customs. Mm -hmm. We need to know are the goods for Doreen or they are for Andrew or they are for Dennis? And if they are for Doreen, is the bill of lading mentioning so? What did you declare as the declarant? Did you say that the goods are for Andrew yet the goods are for Doreen? So those are the kind of things or analysis that is done back in the DPC to see consistency. The documents have to tell a story. Way back from where you're importing from, to the point of declaration to customs. Are you telling us a story that is true? Or there is something that you have tried to alter from what the, the, the exporter gave you? Are the, of course they do that, all the clients do that because they want to run away from maybe the 25% to 10% or they want to run away from the high value to the low value. But back in the DPC, the officers are working and believe me, you you had better declare correctly because when you don't declare correctly, of course there are repercussions that will come after th this discussion that maybe I'm going to get from, from Simon. But those are the key documents. Have the bill of lading speaking the truth. Have the commercial invoice and the parking list. Let them speak. Speak in the sense that when I look at the bill of lading, it's the same story that I'm getting from the declaration that the clearing agent has really uploaded into the system. And also when I look at the invoice, those are the, actually the goods that the client really purchased. And the parking list, what did they pack in that container? Did they pack pens and I'm seeing the, de declar the declarant is saying tissue or TP? 
what is that that is not telling the story? So that is what we do back in the DPC. We look at consistency, we look at accuracy of the documents that you're uploading onto the system. They have to speak to each other, not one saying A, yet another one is saying B. They need B. to be telling a story. They have to tell a story, as mm. I said, way back from China, where you started from bringing these pens, to the point of telling us in URA that actually these are the number of pens that I brought in terms of quantity, in terms of quality and description because some items have at numbers and part numbers. All that has to come out clearly. For Doreen, back on her desk to say, yes, indeed, this client deserves a method one clearance and I'll release your document. But if there is doubt, as I said, of course, I'll query your entry. It gets to level two. And eventually on level two, that's where we shall do the amendment or giving you, issuing you another top up. I would urge clients, I think let us not take a lot of time by not doing what is right. When you do what is right, it reduces on the cost of being business. Because if you declare something that is wrong and back in your head, back down in your sitting room, you're sure you did something that is wrong. The time that is going to be taken, querying you back and forth, asking you this, attach this, why did you say this, yet it's that. I think we can reduce that if we really say that A is A and B is B, and then we reduce on the time that is taken to clear the goods through customs, and then you go to the market and make business. So on that note, Dennis, thank you very much for taking us through that. I'll have Simon get on board because in DPC we deal with a system. It is not, we deal with a system and there are people back there on that system also trying to analyze and come up with so many ideas and <coughs> making our work a little easy, making our work move. In case of anything, we contact them. So before us is Simon, who is going to take us through the manifest splitting. Maybe, Simon, you need to tell us, what is a manifest? Thank you very much. Um, as my colleagues have already spoken about um, the documentation. So when goods are coming to our country, they can either come by, by road or come by water or by, by rail, for example. And air. And air. Mm. So each of these goods, the, all the, each of these uh, means of transport, there has to be a list, and that list is a manifest. The list contains a cargo, if it is cargo, it can also mean it has passengers, it can have a crew, and this, this is very important to a customs officer. Okay. So a manifest is just a list of content that has been transported by air, transported by water, transported by rail. So that is what a manifest is. That is what a manifest that is. That is what a manifest is. Precisely, it's a list of content, content that has been transported into the country by various means of transport. Okay. So this uh, list of content is handed over to, say, for uh, handed by um, the carrier to a customs officer. So okay. the customs officer will understand what has been brought in. Okay, so that is what is a, what a manifest, what a manifest is. is. So again, what is manifest splitting? Manifest splitting mm. is breaking down from when you look at the document that have been handed over, you can have an invoice or a parking list. Okay. A parking list details the items that have been transported, or either in a package or in a, a pallet or in a container, for example. So if, if um, a, a, a transporter, for example, when look at a ship, a ship is only mindful about the, what has been carried in in terms of weight in order to value or to get its income. And yet for a customs officer is interested of what has been brought in. In that ship. In that ship. In, in that those box. Mm. What has brought in in that box. So manifest splitting is breaking them into smaller units that can be declared by our clearing agent or by our client. Okay. Mm. So it's simply breaking the bigger part into smaller units that can be classified differently to suit our declaration. 
that is what breaking splitting, splitting means. Is. It helps us to describe, okay. it helps us to classify goods when a client is declaring. That is manifest breaking. Why is why why are the, why are we breaking the, the declaration? Why isn't it declared as a whole? Why the small packages or splitting? Why are we splitting these packages as just, you say? Just as I said, it helps mm. us to describe them specifically to particular item. Say for example in a bigger package, you may have a, a cup, you okay. may have a hole, you may have computers. All of them are classified differently. And the classification um, helps us to determine what tax is collected in a particular item. Mm. So um, computers, for example, attract different tax heads. Uh, a cup can have all the tax head or say it pays 25% import duty, VAT, withholding tax, um, infrastructure levy, name it. So, Classification is very important. So that is very important that the manifest is broken down in order into smaller units that can be classified separately so that correct taxes are co collected. Mm -hmm. So it helps us to create uh, also to break packages. Because when you break them into smaller, you have, um, say, maybe computers is 10 packages, mm -hmm. um, cups maybe one package. Um, holes may be five packages. So it helps you to break them into different packages. Also helps us to attach correct weights and supplementary units. In supplementary, supplementary units, you mean uh, for um, each item, say for example, um, when you bring in cigarettes, they have different supplementary units, which also have implication in the tax element. Okay. So uh, it also helps us to know how much of cigarettes have been imported in, in terms of weight? Okay. So when you break them into smaller units, you are able to attach weight, you are able to attach the number of packages. Okay. So there is also need to break a manifest into smaller units because it helps you to classify it differently as I mentioned earlier, according to different HSC codes as we normally know. Um, Based on that still, it helps also to attach the uh, TSCs, that is tariff specification codes. Mm -hmm. So one item can have different specification codes. It can be a computer or say tires. Tires are tires and they have the same classification, but they are differentiated because, uh, according to tax uh, tariff specification codes. Okay. By splitting a manifest, it helps us to uh, differentiate them. Someone, maybe if I then uh, before I also want to add that uh, initially, mm. before we allowed uh, our agents to classify, I mean split the manifest, there was also a delay that was caused by C11, because that paper has to move from point to A, point B, point C. So now because of this, um, this what delay. What is maybe through more light? What is the C11? For the C11 a, for is a document that's used know? for making amendment in the in the earlier times. Someone I feel say if a C11 is a document. Okay. It's a document that is filled by a client. Okay. In this, this, in this case, our clearing agent mm. to notify us that there is need to make an amendment. Okay. Uh, I wanted to inter interject at that point where you said, now if it's Doreen having the cup and the hoe and the computer, mm. my, my, is it a master split, this consignment? Or there are instances where I have a consignment. Is there is Doreen, there is Simon, and there is Andrew and Dennis. So we are splitting that consignment for everyone to have their goods. Is now, it so? No, that one now is that is now I think it is degrouping because okay. now you have come in and in group. Each of you has your own package. That is groupage. That is groupage. So okay. in order to separate it, Doreen, Simon, Dennis. Andrew, mm -hmm. then you have to degroup, say that Simon has his, his, his Lubengo, and uh, Doreen has, has their own, own Lubengo, Lubengo mm -hmm. Andrew has. So in that now, in those small packages, in your own Lubengo, in the only you Lubengo, split now the, you can now split, split this according to the document that you have handed over to your clearing agent. Now the clearing agent say that, how do I declare this? Because you have cups, you have a horse, you have computers, uh -huh. you have phones. Uh -huh. So now this one is splitted so to suit those specific the, contents uh, 
that you have, item. declare that you have brought. For you, have only one package, and in what package you have those small items. That is splitting, manifest. And manifest. Mm. And I think that is all done for us to be able to really declare correctly at the first point. Mm -hmm. So that whatever is converted onto the IM7 is speaking the truth. As I said, always get it right the first time, declare the truth so that we reduce on the delays in the DPC and we collect the taxes that really are supposed to be collectible that are fair to each and every client. So, Simon, maybe you take us through again. What does somebody require to, to split? How do they do it maybe? Somebody out there would want to know, maybe the clearing agent watching mm. us wants to know, how do I yes. split this manifest? Yes, before um, the coming in of auto conversion, uh, splitting and a manifest, I think, was done by an officer until, until the agents were empowered. But okay. before they do that, they need to, ha need to be given an access to, to do that. And who allows the access? It is a customs officer at, in Mombasa. Who authorizes? Authorizes the access. The, the clearing agent. Clearing agent. Okay. And that clearing agent must be appointed by the consignee. Yeah, yes, so yes, yes. I can authorize, I can authorize um, an agent to split a manifest, but if that, man, that consignee, I mean that agent has not been um, authorized to clear my goods, the system will reject. Okay. Mm, the system will reject. So, so you, it must be authorized agent to deal must be appointed agent or authorized agent who will do the, the splitting. splitting of the manifest. Okay. So officers in Mombasa mm -hmm. allows access for them to print, I mean to split the, 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 the manifest. manifest. Okay. So then after that, they are able to split the manifest. Okay. That is how the manifest splitting is done before I came to Simon. So um, after they have been allowed, yes. now the agent who has been authorized and allowed to split, now they will be able to split. So, But mm -hmm. before splitting, an agent is expected to come with a worksheet. And mm -hmm. that worksheet, if it was one package carrying 10,000 kilograms, after the end, at the end of the day, the splitted manifest should always have several packages but the same same weight okay same weight should not go beyond the way that has originally manifested okay mm. so they have to come first with the manifest declaring that i have one package in this package i have 10 packages of cups five packages of gametes um seven packages of say phones all okay. carrying the same weight. So the agent is supposed to be mindful about the weights, the weights. they are declaring. The issue of packages is no problem. They will assign as per the packing, the list, packing list that have been given. But the weights should be, should be the same at the end of the day. Simon, so we have scenarios in DPC where we keep querying clients why the weight is not telling with the, with the number of packages. Is it the case? Is it the problem at the point of splitting? How does it come about? Because we've queried so many times when you, you have a four turn and you have 25 pieces of spare parts, then you keep wondering where did the others go? Is it the issue of splitting the weight that some items, the, 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 the declarant is attaching much weight than yes, others? Yes, yes. How are we going to, to curb that? Mm. What measures are you putting in place to, to see that really when the clearing agent is splitting to match the, the pain, to match this, the, num the weight, in terms of weight, because the issues are with weight. So many times we have issues of weight not telling with what they've declared. I um, think that is now where it's coming from. Now, what is happening now, I think um, our developers are working out mm. to see that um, uh, in the splitting, they has to incorporate the, the classification of goods and also the value of, of goods. Okay. So I think when the value of goods comes in, they will be able to, uh, you will be, the, 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 the issue of weight will, will, be, will be sorted. Okay. Mm. So well, yeah. You mean you think it's the classification bringing issues? The classification, because they are classifying vis-a-vis -vis the value of goods that have been brought in. Brought in. 
So okay. the a client is supposed to be now, this, this garment, the value is this and the packages is this. Okay. Mm. So that is going to be addressed. I, that is going to be addressed. Thank you very much. Is there anything more that you'd want mm. to, to light on how to split and how the user should use it, apart from having the authorized age declarant? Um, we, have, we have already trained a number of agents, agent. agents and uh, practically needs to be done practically. But now, right now, we don't have uh, a, 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 um, the other server where we can do. Yeah, but at um, least the, the, the so the, 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 briefly user has been um, shared. Briefly, okay. mm. um, the, the officer in Mombasa will look for that particular bill that Manifest. is supposed to be split, split, and go to modification module okay. and select um, uh, select the modi mod mod modification module. Okay. From the modi modification uh, module, they will go to um, access tab. Click access tab. After that, they will put the, the, the tin of the declarant that has been authorized to, to split, split, the, um, split the bill. The bill. Mm. So once that clearing agent or that client has been authorized, they also do the same through, from the um, manifest binder. Mm. They look for that particular manifest through modification, then from the from the, the split tab, they click that tab and it should be allowed them to to make do the, the split. After okay. that, then they verify. After verification, they validate the split. As simple as that. Okay, so there is sensitization going on. There is training going on for this. We have already agents. trained some of them. Some of them mm. are being trained, mm. Mm. and training is going on at their viewers and listeners for the clearing agents to learn how mm. to do this, to reduce on the number of queries that will be raised in DPC and thus reduce the time taken to clear declaration through DPC. Mm. Back to you, Andrew. Maybe. Yes, maybe Simon before, still mm, has something mm. to share. Okay. So what are the benefits of, uh, of splitting, okay. splitting the manifest? Okay. It, is, it, it gives us faster clearance of cargo gives us accurate uh, declaration. Okay. It avoids penalties due to misdeclaration, and this reduces the cost of doing business. Okay. And also reduces the inconvenience that is caused by misdeclaration, uh, misclassification. At warehousing. Mm, at warehousing. Ex okay. warehousing. So then finally, finally, this is what our clients need to note. After assessment of a WT8, amendments are not possible True. because the expectation is why we allowed you allowed our clients to split the manifest so that they can make the correct more accurate declarations unlike before so um then such goods after uh, any, any any goods that have not been declared after the wt8 mm. they are deposited and deposits are, are, attracts penalties yeah so they should that should be avoided. Okay. That should be avoided. That's what I wanted to add. You wanted to say that after you've made the declaration, there is no it's not possible to amend no. a WTA. So that's what I said. I repeat myself that do the right thing the first time. Because the amendment comes in with penalties that you're incurring more cost of doing business. Because there's if it will be intentional. If you're guided on how to do something, kindly follow what you've been guided to do to reduce on the cost of doing business. The number of penalties that you pay, that much money that you're going to pay in penalties. If you avoided and did the correct thing, maybe you save and maybe you yield more profits at the end of it all. So it is geared to kindly, yeah, yeah, all the processes, all the measures that you are is coming up with to improve on the declaration, to improve the, the, the system, it is all geared to, to make the clearing process easy and also to collect the correct revenue that we are supposed to collect to get out of the economic independence that we are in as the, that it has always been. Fun. So we pray that you follow and we pray that this discussion has helped you to get better in your clearing process and also do better with the documentation. Maybe, Andrew, back to you. 
what is this boarding off of vehicles and what are the boarded off motor vehicles? I'm sure some listener out there you, would want to hear that. Are you interested in acquiring one? Yeah, you never know, you never know. Yes. Actually, boarding off is an interesting subject. Thank you, Doreen. Uh, these are vehicles exempted at importation. Okay. But uh, later sold off to non-exempted persons. That is one category. We have another category of vehicles not, e not uh, exempted at importation, but registered under government. We have several ent entities for registration of motor vehicles. Motor vehicles for government, the red embossed in yellow, these are motor vehicles. Of late, they are paying taxes on their motor vehicles. So these are motor vehicles imported, uh, not exempted at importation, but registered under government, but later sold off to individuals. individuals. That is the second category of boarded off motor vehicles. There are also those under government that were in, exempted at importation and later sold off to non-exempted persons. The third category is motor vehicles not exempted at importation but registered under statutory bodies. Okay, or statutory agencies bodies like you are at the, okay. uh, Civil Aviation Authority, KCCA, UNBS, UNRWA, but sold off to individuals. Ordinary Ugandans, it is also a boarding of process. So we have three categories of boarding of processes, and their management is different. Okay. It is informed take us by through one by one by the extension procedure codes, which are determinants of applicable tax rates. Okay. On the event that you have uh, a motor vehicle that was uh, exempted at importation, but later sold off to an unexempted entity. That motor vehicle you use extension procedure code for 490. Okay. So 490, it is subject to a depreciation schedule that is provided for under our departmental instructions. Departmental instruction 14 of 2010 September. So okay. the, dep the depreciation schedule is if it happens to be boarded off within a period of zero to, to one year, it is depreciated at a rate of 30 percent. Okay. One to two years, it is 45 percent. Two to three years, it is 60 percent. Three to four years, it is 70 percent. Over four years, it is 75 percent. So here, we consider the entry at first time registration at importation. So we consider what the customs you? value in foreign Dang. currency, whether US dollars, euros, Japanese yen, uh, Swedish krona. So it is that customs value that is subject to the depreciation schedule I, okay. talk, I, talked, I, I talked about earlier. Mm. So upon depreciation, we subject the same to the current exchange rate okay. of that currency note. The current exchange rate, for example. That is the running, dollar, that is prevailing. Okay. So that's what is determined. It is, if it is a, a motor vehicle that was not exempted, but registered by government, but later sold to... Okay. So we need to confirm. Mm -hmm. So there what you pay is what we call um, registration fees and withholding tax. Yeah. Because at import pay VAT, import duty, and infrastructure levies. If they are to be registered by Minister of Works, we don't assess them registration fees. So what we look out for here are the withholding taxes and registration fees. Upon confirmation that pay they paid taxes okay. at importation. For those that are paid taxes but registered as statutory bodies, if you happen buying a motor vehicle that was previously owned by URA, still upon confirmation of payment of taxes at importation, we use uh, extension procedure code 407. These are controlled uh, procedure codes. Controlled. It is done upon request. request. So configuration is, also is you make a formal request, so we generate a memorandum to systems 
so they can figure upon confirmation. Okay. So these ones only pay re-registration fees of, of 200,000 um, okay. and form fees of 5,000 okay. and withholding taxes. Okay. So basically that is uh, boarding off. Boarding and the, requirement, off. the documents required mm. which are pertinent, are pertinent the yes, original yes. logbook cancelled by the Minister of Works. Okay. That is important. Proof yeah. of surrender of the number plates to the Minister of Works okay. for direct government vehicles Usually the logbook is cancelled in red, okay. embossed sales agreement or, or government auctioneer's reports, whichever is applicable. Normally okay. what we call a bill of sale. Mm. Evidence that a sale took place. How did you acquire this motor vehicle? Was it stolen? How was it acquired? Okay. Motor vehicle inspection report by the chief mechanical engineer, That's Minister key. of Works. Mm. Newspaper adverts. adverts in cases of auctioned government vehicles, evidence that there was a process True. that informed the process of you acquiring this motor vehicle. Okay. Authority to release motor, boarded off motor vehicles from various government ministries, departments, and agencies. Vehicle handover certificates were applicable. App application letter to manager warehousing for permission to be granted for you to register this motor vehicle. That is also pertinent. National identity card for the owner previous mm -hmm. declaration to customs at importation to confirm that it is really boarded off. Actually, you need to put in a, a client help, a help to, to ticket, ticket to customs planning and, and statistics mm. for declarations at importation that were captured under the old system of customs declaration, Ascuta Plus Plus, to confirm that really there is an entry at importation that accounted for its entry into the country and okay. photos of the vehicle showing the chassis number and engine number. Okay. Briefly, that is what is Thank you, anyone. thank you very much, and Andrew. Mm -hmm. Yes, Simon, briefly. Uh, there's also, I think, one that we have missed. Um, the um, vehicles that come in with very number place, that is, for example, the returnees. How are those ones handled? Mm -hmm. The returnees, returnees for one to, and you mean, the returnee, the what informs the, one to be granted the, exemption? No, no, no. Mm. What I meant is, a returnee came with this vehicle, mm. but after some time decides to sell to another non-entitled person. How is that one handled? Those are motor vehicles I boarded off that I categorized as uh, vehicles exempted at importation. A returning resident is granted that facility of exemption okay. at importation. But afterwards, when they dispose of that motor vehicle to a non-exempted person, yes. it is what we call boarding off. It mm -hmm. is subject to the other depreciation schedule, schedule and the taxes applicable. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, Andrew, for that kind of information. Maybe we cannot leave without trying to bring out, Dennis, quickly, if somebody is not satisfied, if the client is not satisfied with the, the amendment that we've done in DPC, are there avenues that this client can go through to be heard? Kindly Take her through briefly there in two or three minutes, please. Yes. To address the dissatisfaction of maybe the top up that we've raised, the classification that we've put to them. Are there avenues that they can use to get to be heard in your A? Yes, uh, there are avenues in the event that the client is not satisfied with the decision that has been taken in DPC, that client has a right to appeal first to DPC and uh, await a decision which will be provided as quick as possible. That client, if still not satisfied with the decision that uh, the appeals committee in DPC has taken, can still bring the matter to the attention of the supervisor of the manager DPC and still not satisfied can appeal to the AC and also still not satisfied can appeal the AC trade which then will also make a decision. So okay. like we said, the client has many avenues. Avenues to, to use. Yes, to Actually, in the decision. It uh, uh, you, you will have what we, we constitute as an appeals committee that is weekly based in DPC okay. for handling such client issues. Issues, yeah. If one is not satisfied with the findings of uh, resolutions of the appeals process mm. that is set up set up in DPC on a weekly basis, they have chance of appealing to the Assistant Commissioner of Field Services. Yes. Still, if they are not satisfied with his response, mm. 
the other alternative is appealing to the Assistant Commissioner Trade Division of Customs. Okay. That is the process. Okay, our dear viewers and listeners, that is how we do it in DPC. It has been the topic of DPC processing. DPC processes are the documents required. I think you have learned from us how we wish that the time would allow us to continue and continue. But maybe in the closing remarks, Dennis, please, can you have your closing remarks for the people? Uh, again, just to remind our dear viewers and listeners that uh, Document Processing Center is there to facilitate you. We are there to ensure that we process your transactions as fast as possible, in the shortest time possible. And for us to be able to do this, we also need your support. And your support in terms of the issues I highlighted, that when you make a declaration, please ensure that your declaration is correct. Your declaration is supported by the right documentation so that we avoid these delays. Also, where queries have been raised, we would like to request our dear clients, please read the query properly, give sufficient response, provide a concrete response, and cover all the issues that have been raised. We have circumstances where someone has been asked about one thing or five things, they choose to respond to one. It wastes a lot of time where you have to keep responding to this one, then the other one raised again, then this one, then this one. We have instances where someone is queried and they say, okay. So all these cause delays. And some, those are some of the challenges that we are experiencing as a DPC, the poor documentation, the poor declarations that we make, the insufficient queries, and responses, and even delayed queries and responses. Now you are aware that the system is automated. Once you don't respond to a query in about three days, you will be suspended. This causes inconveniences both to the client and also to the declarant, the firm. You're going to lose business, and you might find that the client has several transactions, maybe others are on the way. They're also not able to declare. So let's uh, support each other. Let's try as much as possible to do the right thing. On our part, we pledge to do the right thing, the fairest way possible, and to engage you as much as possible, to listen to you, to get to understand what challenges you're experiencing, for example, so that we, we, we fasten the clearance process, reduce on the cost of doing business, and we ensure that we facilitate our traders, and also in return, uh, raise enough revenue for our national development. Thank you very much, Dennis. Closing remarks for Andrew. Mm. Uh, agents mainly that we deal with and uh, clients that recommend those agents should always feel free to contacting DPC. We are there to serve them. In cases where issues are not clear, our offices are always open. Telephone lines are always open. The client help tool module is there for them. So they should feel free to, to getting to learn more because learning never ceases. Because we have issues of insufficient uh, query responses, and you end up doing uh, work that would have been done by an agent. Mm -hmm. So you, 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 there are scenarios where you see issues of a knowledge gap, mm -hmm. but uh, because they fear contacting officers, uh, it takes a lot of uh, delays. Okay. We end up delaying on, uh, on, uh, on the mandate that we have to offer, revenue generation, and... Uh, Time clearance is affected, yeah. so they should feel free, feel at home to always Engage. contacting DPC, engaging DPC to get to know. More. That conversation will help to, to realizing, helping us realizing revenue faster. Okay. Hmm. Simon, your closing remarks. Um, thank you very much, Doreen. Um, my closing remarks is just to encourage our clients to do, to split the manifest properly to make in order to make a correct um, to do things right first time yeah. so that we don't avoid delays ask your clients many questions so that you can get more sufficient information as much as you can to enable you make a correct declaration um, in case you uh, meet any challenges in turn in, in this one I mean all our clients both internal and external make a best use of uh, our help tool who are there to serve you in time. 
Thank you very thank much. You, thank you, thank you very much, my panelists. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Simon. To our dear viewers and listeners, the webinar for customs DPC specifically has come to an end. One word I need to leave for the team is, and mostly the clearing agents, let's do it right the first time and we reduce on the time taken to make the declaration and also the time taken to clear out through customs. Get it right the first time and we shall really get revenue and collect the correct revenue. The I want to thank to, you. To being receptive to their concerns. Yes, the pledge of being receptive is there. The officers, the attitude is up there. They are positive in addressing your issues. Please feel free to engage them. Continue using our help tool lines. Continue using the help tool module, module to log in your issues and the tickets that will be raised. The issues will be solved. I want to thank you, Dennis, thank you, Andrew, once again, and thank you, Simon, for the time and the discussion that we've had. Thank you very much. I'm called Natmanya Skovia. I came to get a team. I was passing by and I saw a bus, so I was forced to come here and get one. It was not hectic because it didn't take much time. Like five minutes or less. Very happy. I'm still training with National Water and without a team, you cannot be employed. I encourage everyone out there who is not having a team to come and register because I know the world that is coming without a team, you will not be able to do anything. Uganda Revenue Authority. Developing Uganda together. Acquiring a tin is now easier than ever before with a new interface that is brief, simple and cuts out all the excess fields from previous applications. All you need is your national ID or driver's license or passports and internet access and you're good to go. No more waiting in long queues as you can now acquire a tin instantly from wherever you are. Remember, it's free! Experience our new and improved modern interface that is user-friendly. Thank you for paying your taxes. Uganda Revenue Authority. Developing Uganda together. Kapo, you seem to be in a hurry. Where are you going to? I'm going to pay URA visit. Why would anyone visit URA? Of all places? To know more about the Kakasa Business Solutions, namely digital tracking solution, the voluntary disclosure program and electronic fiscal receipting, and invoicing solution which have turned my business around. You know I need to be on top of my game to protect my empire. <laughs> yeah, if you know, you know. I too need to know what Kapo knows. Kakasa, be sure you are in charge of your business. Uganda Revenue Authority, developing Uganda together. Revenue Authority. Developing Uganda together. In chairs, the small one can become the big one. It's the small